Hello! Welcome to Friends at Film Camp, the podcast where two friends that gather by the fire from our fun film perspectives. I'm Julian. And I'm Luke. And today we're talking about The Boys in the Band. Is that what it's called? Yes. The Boys in the Band? The Boys in the Band. Okay, The Boys in the there Band no, has a fun backstory. There so was gonna... no band to speak of, and that was very confusing to me. Okay, well, this might make more sense. Okay. Uh, the Boys in the Band is based on the play by the, of the same name, released yeah. from 1968. The author of the play has talked about how uh, he wrote the show like right before Stonewall, and it was really one of the first big commercial projects about gayness in uh-huh. North America recent times. Uh, the play then was adapted to uh for its 50th anniversary to Broadway with this same cast that's in the movie uh mm-hmm. and then Ryan Murphy helped to convert it into film with the same cast members and the same director of the show oh that's interesting and yeah it very much feels like a play it, like i could tell that it was a play basically from the first scene like not the first montage scene but like the first like scene with the two characters interacting yes i'm like this feels like a play it does have very play energy uh especially with like it feels kind of like a good uh uh like a cheap play like not in like a uh, uh reference of quality but like because it's in one location and most of the plot is just like kind of different tableaus of people talking yes so it it seems very play like and like oh i could easily put this on with like a smallish budget you know yes it has one set primarily yeah so it's it's very well used another interesting thing that i think you'll like is that this mm-hmm. is the first version of this play uh, to ever ha- feature an entirely openly gay cast. Oh, that's cool. So the entire cast is openly gay. I appreciate that Jim Parsons has, like, it's like he he kind of did the Robert Pattinson thing where he got his money <laughs> from uh, the Big Bang Theory. And then now he almost, like, exclusively seems to do, like, small, like, gay roles. And I'm like, yeah, I see what you did. And I, <laughs> I, I can respect that. He's paid his due. He just needs to do this now. Yeah. But yeah. So the film is about a party being thrown by Jim Parsons' character, uh, Jim Parsons' character, Michael. Mickey. For his yeah. friend Harold, where he has a bunch of his gay friends come over, and then his former college roommate shows up, mm-hmm. and conversations ensue. I this movie was almost the opposite of what I was expecting. Like I thought that this is gonna be like a fun gay romp that was like a biopic of some band in the late 60s uh where like most of the members were gay and it was just gonna be like a fun little biopic with like ooh, like here's this guy's boyfriend and here's here's how they met and then we're gonna like make some fun music and that was not what this movie was <laughs> at <laughs> all it was a very emotional like dramatic awkward tense party like character study and i was like i uh, i was i i because i had such a it was such a shocking revelation what the movie was actually about. It's hard for me to tell if I liked it or not because it's like I I went into it expecting like the opposite thing, you know? Like I don't I think at the end of the day I don't think it was badly done at all, but I don't know if I liked it. Huh. I I enjoyed it. So I'm kind I'm surprised you wouldn't like it. Maybe your expectations were part of the problem. No, it very it very well could have been that. But I had an issue with the characters are like they're so mean so much of the time. And I have I have just a hard time with like meanness. More so than like <sighs> more serious things like in our In our last film we were talking about, you know, like, every fucking character was an assassin. But it's, like, that's kind of more um, fantastical that I can, like, accept it 
better in like a like a film scenario whereas if a character is just mean i i have a harder time like connecting to them you know what i mean i know what you mean but i disagree with you because okay, I'm on. i really think that the the film is trying to focus on the pain they're all feeling because they have to hide their yeah. sexuality, but also to be openly homosexual. Yeah. Like, these are not people... These are people who are in a lot of pain. Mm-hmm. It's very clear very early on. All these people no. are, like, they're really... Excuse me. They're really suffering right now. No, you're really... You're, you're, you're very right, and that's, like part of why I think it's it's really well done because even in their their meanness it's more like yeah it's more like insecurities and lashing out like I don't uh but okay (laughs) okay so fun fact about me is I normally avoid sad gay movies as much as I can because they make me too sad uh like I can't handle it so just the fact that this was a sad gay movie I was kind of like I had to I don't know emotionally separate myself from it a little bit Mm -hmm. uh like I watched uh the first time I watched Brokeback Mountain it fucking crushed me and I have not been able to watch it since like I have a DVD of it and I look at it sometimes and I'm like I can't go there uh (laughs) So, which is so why it will be like, next week's episode on the podcast <laughs> so i think part of that's like a very personal thing where i just find like i've been oversaturated with gay sadness especially in film that i just have like a very low tolerance for it now mm. which is like a very personal thing and it's not like a that's not really a criticism of the the film because i do think it's well done and and you're right. It is a it is a good character study. Yes. Uh, so let's get into the movie because uh, this is going to be interesting to talk about because they are just kind of talking the whole time. Yeah, there's not really like a traditional plot. It's just tableaus of conversations. Mm-hmm. But the opening uh, we see it's 1968. Uh, And everyone's kind of in the city getting ready for a party. Uh, Michael, who's played by Jim Parsons, uh, gets a call from his friend Donald, who's kind of going to be arriving. Michael gets a call from his friend Donald, who's going to be arriving early. Uh, When Donald arrives, they both talk about how they're old and sad. And then Michael's old roommate calls... Uh, crying, which he doesn't normally do because he's like a real strong, tough, straight man energy. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he calls crying and says he needs to talk to Michael. Michael tries to, like, get him... Because... I don't know. This is interesting with what happens later in the film, but Michael's very, like, concerned. Uh, He doesn't want this guy to know he's gay. And so he tries to get him to, like, not... He doesn't want him to be at the party with all his gay friends. Uh, But, yeah, then he, like, breaks down crying. And it's very, like, you know... If a friend called you and acted the way What's-His-Face did on the phone, you'd be like, okay, I need to see them, like, right now, you know? So it... Yeah. um, I like how they showed that. It was was very nice on Michael's part. Um, And I... Donald? Did you say Donald was the other guy? Yes. Uh, wait. I think he's Donald is the third friend. So he's not Jim he's Parsons, and he's not. Uh, uh, which one is? Uh, he's not Alan. He's Alan, Michael, and Donald. I'm thinking of Matt Bomer's character. Yes, Matt Bomer. That's Donald. Yeah. I think he was my favorite because he was the nicest. <laughs> Uh, But he's also not really involved in much of the drama of the film. He's just kind of there most of the time. Mm -hmm. I think that's his whole thing. He's kind of supposed to be the the calming presence. But he does stuff later. Does he? Yeah, we'll get to that. Okay. Uh, So (laughs) I liked this intro. I liked how we kind of got to see just a little bit of everyone. 
The and apartment, the... the apartment that Michael lives in is so cute. Yes, this apartment set. I could tell that the director or the, or the producers or whoever was in charge of making sure the set was good. Uh, yeah. They realized we have to spend the whole movie yeah. in this one room, basically. We get a few cuts every now and then out, but we really just spend our time here. So we need to work really hard to make sure this apartment looks good everywhere. And they did. It looks such like a detailed, well-used apartment. Yeah. It's not like those movies where you see these people who go to their apartment and it's just like an empty room where there's a TV and a couch. And it's like, no one lives like this. This It definitely felt like someone lived there. And I found... uh... There's sort of, like, a consistent thing that, like, Michael is in a bunch of debt, and he's just, like, he spends money he doesn't have all the time, uh, which, that just really stresses me out, <laughs> and uh, that did make me, like, the apartment is so cool, but it's also very big, and they're in uh, New York, but also it's, like, 68, so I don't know what New York pricing was like. I assume it wasn't I good. Feel- I assume it was just supposed to be like a little cheap thing that he made nice with lots of effort. Yeah, it could be. But it could also just be that he's living like way above his means. Yes, that's, that's probably like part- it too. Which I fa- find kind of made, it made the location uh, like um, unstable as well. It was such a nice set. And I, I liked, this is unrelated to the set, but the mm-hmm. dynamic at the start between Michael and uh, Alan. Yes, Alan. This was a interesting thing because mm-hmm. it's it covers a topic that I I particularly enjoy the struggle, like talking about what this struggle means without getting too much into it of like what it means to have what it means to be a gay person or an LGBTQ person who has a dear friend who's homophobic. Yeah. And it like, it's just not a thing that's super talked about, but he, like Michael really cares about his relationship with Alan. Yeah. Even though he knows Alan would not like that he is uh, homosexual. Mm -hmm. So I liked that dynamic at the start when like he was clearly trying to make it work. Yeah. And I could see it was hard for him. (laughs) But it also comes up later, which is part of what I found interesting, that, like, Michael also knows or heavily suspects that Alan is, like, closeted. Yes. Which I thought was interesting in how concerned he was before about um, him not like suspecting that he was gay but i i don't know i've never been in that situation so maybe that makes sense emotionally if not like logically yeah i think it makes sense in the, especially in the context of this film and the stuff michael knows about with him yeah so like i understand the dynamic of him tr- i understand he's trying to be the friend who can help him if he ever does come out, but he doesn't, like, want to force it on him. Yeah. Till later when he forces it on him. We'll get to that, too. Well, we also find out, an important thing that we establish in this beginning with, uh, like, Donald, is that Michael isn't drinking. And we get the impression that he used to be, like, a a pretty big partier. And uh, they kind of talk about how Michael gets, like, really mean when he drinks, and he stopped drinking because he was drinking too much and he got like tired of the shame basically the the next day for like what he had done previously when he was drunk um so that comes very important because at one point when he starts drinking he gets very fucking mean so i did appreciate that we were warned at least i know i thought about that the second he got like was getting drunk and was getting meaner and meaner i'm like oh my gosh thank goodness you told me when Michael drinks, he gets very mean very quickly. Yeah. Because that's, like, very useful later on when he suddenly gets a lot meaner. And you're like, why yeah. are you getting mean? But it's because he got stressed out 
that yeah. his friend found out all his other friends were gay and he like needed a drink. So an- another thing this movie does, which is also very play-like, and it reminds me of this uh, brand of play. And I've, I've read one for an English class I was in. It was, I want to say Greek tragedy, but it's, it's not. But it's sort of similar with like gods and magic and chaos. And there's like a chorus. Do you know what that's called? No, I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay. Well, whatever this type of play is, this film reminds me of that because it's like every introduction of a new character is sort of it's a really big deal and it and it changes the path of the party that we're on. Yeah. Um so we uh when the party kind of starts getting going and we get introduced to like all of our main uh characters and um everyone's hanging out and there's this the the party is for Harold and Harold is very late and honestly I thought Harold didn't exist until he showed up <laughs> yes yeah. like I didn't think he was real but uh so um everyone is hanging out uh oh shoot wait who is the uh the couple who is together uh you're talking about Andrew Reynolds Larry and uh Tuck Wakens Hank. Yeah, who was which one was the math teacher? Uh Hank. Ugh, I felt so bad for Hank. Like Hank wasn't doing anything wrong and like everyone was making fun of him the whole time and like they kind of resolve it, but I just I just felt really bad for Hank. I um got nervous what? at the first when I saw these two characters cuz I thought their whole character arc was going to be them fighting, them realizing they're a bad couple, then breaking up. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I don't want to just see a couple end their relationship at a party because they're drunk. Yeah. They didn't do that, which I liked. But I, I understand. Hank, I could tell, was like the punching block there. But yeah, I like- also, like, I understand the where they're coming from. Like, they're all straight people. They're so annoying. And Hank is by far the most straight passing of yeah. the nine people there. But Other, he's actually, still like people. It it it's it they almost treat him like he is straight. And it's like obviously like he left his wife and kids, like he's very in love with Larry and it's like I don't know if I'd they're... say they were that mean to him. Like they were I, I think they were a bit mean at the start when they were making some jokes like that but i don't yeah i don't think it continued the whole time through i the resolution for them was interesting because basically what larry needs is a like polyamorous relationship but like before they had the words for that um like an open relationship yeah but the I I don't know. Obviously, that was, like, a big issue between them that they hadn't super sorted, and then they kind of, like, agreed to try to sort it out. So, like, that was Actually, nice. And I don't think he wanted a polyamorous relationship. Why? What do you mean? Well, I just looked up, because I'm like, I don't know, actually, what the word polyamorous means. And what? Polyamorous means, like, groups. Multiple people at once. Yeah, but not, not always together. There's different ways to be polyamorous. Okay. Oh, yeah. What he was saying to uh, Hank was he wanted to be able to uh, sleep with and see other people and he wouldn't tell Hank about it. But if Hank asked, he would tell him and like he never agreed to be monogamous and that's like not something he could do. You could argue with whether it's polyamorous or just like an open relationship. But yeah, basically, he, yeah, basically Larry he, wanted multiple partners, but he wanted to come home to Hank. Yeah, like he didn't he didn't. <laughs> he didn't want to be like a like a cheating asshole but he was like i can't be monogamous um and it was like obviously they had had this like conversation before so like that was i i appreciated that resolution um it just felt like it like it felt like at the beginning there were so many vibes that like larry hated hank like it, he seemed like he really didn't like him it was weird to me yes i I just thought, that's why I was nervous, because I was like, they're just, Larry's being so moody, 
right yeah. now. And I'm like, oh, is it just going to be them like fighting? And then Larry's like, I'm an ass and I'm going to leave you forever. But I, I enjoyed as it went on, like when the problem came out and then the phone game and they resolved it and they were like, okay, we'll try and make this work. I just felt like that was, I don't know. I felt like Larry was being an asshole, not even to do with wanting an open relationship, because that's fine, as long as he was being honest about it, which he was. So, like, besides all that, I just thought he was being an asshole to Hank for, like, most of the movie. And I'm like, I don't understand why you're, you seem like you hate your partner. So, like, I don't really know I just thought they were fighting. Yeah, it could be, yeah. Like, I just thought it was the middle of fight day, and then he That's was true. We, flirting we've never with uh, seen, Matt. We've never seen any part of this relationship besides this one night, so that's very possible that it was just, like, a fight. Yeah. Well, I thought it was a fight because of, uh, like, I just felt the energy. They still wanted each other there. It wasn't like they wanted to get away from each other. They just wanted to mm-hmm. make the other one mad. Yeah, that's true. Like, Larry kept flirting with Donald and Hank. Not in the same way, but Hank was kind of getting close to Alan. Mm Mm-hmm. Out of, like, a gentlemanly respect, but also in a, if this goes somewhere, that wouldn't be terrible energy. I don't think that's what Hank was doing. That's what I got from it. But I can, this play, this movie is very open to, uh interpretation a lot of stuff is like left up to you i thought hank was being really nice because he knew that he was the most straight passing and so he took the like i'm gonna hang out with donald because michael had told them all beforehand like try not to act gay well this dude is here and everyone did horribly but hank (laughs) was like i'm going to like do a terrible job at that yeah, he's like, I'm going to talk to Donald because I'm the most straight passing and, like, I'll keep him occupied, basically. That's what I thought Hank was doing. I got that, too. Um, They're having, like, a gay old time. They're doing a little dance. And everyone's very happy at this point. We haven't gotten into, like, much drama. Um, and, yeah, then Harold shows up when he wasn't supposed to. He had called Michael and been like, oh, sorry about before. Hold like, I'll on. see you tomorrow. You're talking about what? Alan. Alan, <laughs> I I strongly advise that you have the name list open. It's very helpful. So I just okay, think of all these actors look. as their actor name. Let me go here. I'll get it open. Uh, the boys in the band. Why is it called the boys in the band? Uh, What's the band? I don't There's know no for sure. I think they would have had to pick a straight sounding name because it was 68. So you couldn't uh-huh. have picked a name like The Gay Night Out or something. Yeah. So they picked something like, they're a bunch of boys and they're together. It's like a band of friends. That's mm-hmm. my guess. I'm sure if I like looked it up. Why is it called The Boys in the Band? Let's see what Google tells us. It doesn't say without me actually uh-huh. having to read stuff, which seems like a lot of work. So when um, Alan shows up, it is so tense. This is when I texted you and was like, this is so awkward and I'm really stressed out because Michael had made it clear before that he didn't want this guy to know he was gay. And everyone did such a fucking terrible job. Except for Hank. Hank was trying real hard. Hank was trying real hard. Emery was being like zero, zero percent trying. Like, well, I, like, I thought that. What? Yeah. But then I was like, maybe this is like as straight as Emery can be. Maybe. But maybe. then I was like, I don't know. He did flick out a I fan. Think, I think part of it was on purpose. I think he was like rebelling. <laughs> against Michael wanting him to act straight and he was like fuck you Michael like if your friend can't deal with you being gay like I think he was kind of doing like a I'm going to be gay for your own good sort of thing yes um so anyway when Alan shows up it is very tense because yeah he's like just extremely straight kind of 
in a in a bad vibes way, which we find out later is sort of valid because um after he kind of talks with everyone him and michael go upstairs for some reason i don't know why they're upstairs uh, but they're separated. i think michael was like okay these gays are doing a terrible job at being straight i need to get them away from here yeah so they're like chatting and then alan kind of goes on this uh, homophobic thing he really likes hank and he's like wow hank is so handsome <laughs> And Michael's like, yeah, he is, uh, Alan. And then Alan's like, ugh, I hate that Emery, though. And Emery is, like, by far the most, like, effeminate of them all. And, uh, Alan's, um, not Alan, uh, Michael's like, oh? (laughs) And then, yeah, Hank calls him, like, I don't know, some slur of some sort, and is like, ugh. I just, like, he's so unfunny and, like, annoying, and I, ugh, like, the gays so annoying um awesome. which is obviously like upsetting to michael yes i like how the way this show one of the big ways he tries to show this is like a real straight man was mm-hmm. when he asked for his drink he says scotch and then they're like if it's too strong we can water it down for you and he's like no no this is fine and then he just yeah. drinks his scotch strong and everyone like looks at him like wow you're so straight you drink straight scotch is that not how you normally drink scotch? I don't know that much about scotch. I think you do normally drink scotch like that. It's just the way the movie framed it. This was like, this is a clear sign that this is a straight man. <laughs> and I was like, this is a weird sign to make that a straight man. But also, the, they're so dedicated to it that I was like, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so then I don't remember exactly what happens when they go back downstairs. He goes down, he talks to them for a bit, and then uh, Alan says something rude to Emroy, and Emroy, or Alan says something like, you want to suck my dick, don't you? And then Emroy makes like a snappy comeback. Is it? I thought it was Emery. Is it? I think so, Emery. Okay, I'll go Emery. Uh, Emery uh, says something (laughs) snappy back to him. Yeah. And then Alan clearly wasn't expecting that, and he punches him in the face. And calls him a slur. Yes. Punches him in the face multiple times. Oh, yes. He does. Um, he tries to, like, beat him up. And then it's very good violent. old Hank pulls him off. Yeah. So everyone's, like, pulling them apart. It's very dramatic. Oh. Eh, we'll get to him later. It's very dramatic. And um, that is when... Uh, Harold shows up, and I, like I said before, I didn't think Harold was real, so I was shocked that Harold was real. (laughs) But also, throughout the rest of the movie, Harold did not feel like a real person to me. Like, he almost comes across as like a, he comes across as like a godlike figure or something. You know what I mean? I don't know how I feel about Harold. I understand what they're doing, where Harold's supposed to kind of act like he's better than everyone but also he kind of is better than everyone Uh uh-huh but he goes on a lot of like philosophical philosophical saying yeah where he just kind of says these long spiels about uh people and why they do what they do and i'm like like okay harold could you also just be a person (laughs) Him and Michael have, like, this really weird conversation about, like, beauty and, like, it, like, the value of it and, like, if it should have as much value. But it's, it's, it's not like they're having a debate. It's like they're talking about something else that we don't know about. Um, Because Michael especially is very, like, almost hurt by this conversation but it's like you guys are talking about something else that i don't know about like something happened between you two and i don't know what it was you know yes um but yeah harold is interesting i feel like i definitely feel like he's like a uh this goes back to the whatever type of play that i can't remember what it's called uh he feels like a like the god type figure but not in like the christian way in like the greek way where gods are like (laughs) <laughs> like total messes themselves you know like zeus or something um where they're kind of like they're gods but they're also sort of like trickster characters like that's completely what harold felt like to me and he's also like constantly 
he talks about himself like he's the ugliest person to ever exist in the world, which is also kind of weird. Like, he's played by Zachary Quinto, so, like, he's not ugly at all. Um, Harold's a weird person. Harold? I don't... I. I don't know if I liked Harold's character. Uh, Harold goes on a lot of philosophical rants, and they're they're useful in terms of the story. And they it's always clear this is just the dynamic he plays in the group. They like yeah. him, but he's kind of better than he acts as if he's better than everyone in the sim in a similar way to Michael, but. Uh, Harold does it through, like, philosophical instead of monetary stuff. Mm. If that makes sense. But, yeah. Zachary Quinto does a... I don't know if I like this character. I feel like Harold Harold is just a weird thing. Yeah. Harold is definitely a weird addition to the group. Um, but they but do he... set him up that he's weird. Like, it's not just a yeah. thing that he does. Like, he's not just, like, out of nowhere, this odd guy. Like, they build him up that he's eccentric. Yeah. So, the him showing up, he shows up basically in the midst of the fallout from Alan attacking Emery. Um, so, everyone's still kind of, like, high energy from that and like recovering from fucking alan just like attacking emery um and then harold shows up and it completely again changes the whole dynamic of the situation um so everyone kind of tries to calm down because like the birthday boy's here and uh i guess this is a good time to talk about uh the cowboy or the male prostitute (laughs) his literal (laughs) name is cowboy and that again, they were so fucking mean to him. And he was just a sweetie. Like, he was classic, like, himbo energy. He was very nice. He wasn't super smart. But, like, he didn't deserve them all to be just, like, fucking dicks to him all the time. No, but I never saw them. They were all mean to each other. I never thought that they were particularly mean to him. They were just being mean in general. No, I 100% disagree. They were so mean to him all the time. They treated him like less than a human. I like the Kawaii character. I like him too. That's why that part of why I'm so mad that they were so mean to him. Yes. But that that's why they have to be they're mean to everyone. But they did think he was very dumb. And yeah, he was that's a fine. Dumb. Yeah, but he's allowed. He is He's a prostitute. Birthday party entertainment. Prostitute. (sighs) But yeah, that was another thing that I had a problem with in terms of like... It it just made me sad. Uh, I liked the cowboy. I thought he was cute. And I liked how the ways they tried to like humanize him. Especially Mm -hmm. with the final line when he's leaving with Harold. Mm -hmm. Where he says, I try to make it a bit more affectionate so I don't feel like such a whore. Yeah. And I thought, aww, this guy's very endearing. He's very endearing. He's a nice guy. He's doing his best. Yeah, he does have a great There was also a line that was really sad. Ugh. This poor guy. I just want to, like, fucking help him out. They were, like, talking about how much he was to hire for the night. And Emery was like, oh, he was a steal. And (laughs) he was like, I'm not a steal. I'm $25. I have, like, tears in my eyes. Like, this poor guy just needs someone to, like... He was $25. I think he was just 20 He was so, like... He was so... He was so, like... Ah, uh, genuine too. Like he, it's like he thought Emery was saying like he what didn't cost anything or something. He's like, no, I'm expensive. He was endearing. He was mostly the comic relief character <laughs> yeah. in the story, yeah, yeah. which they needed because it's very tense most of the time. It is very tense. So his so, role was kind of to lighten things up whenever he did there, and he did a great job of it because he was mm-hmm. so endearing. Oh, I remember what happens after Harold shows up. So they go out to, like, the balcony to open gifts. And Alan feels, like, really sick after, like, attacking Emery. So he and Hank 
uh, go to the bathroom for a while for Alan to, like, throw up, which is good, because then we have, like, a bit of a break from Alan and his dramatics um, while we deal with Harold and his dramatics. Uh, and then we're, like, opening presents and stuff. Oh, yeah! And then something 100% happened between Harold and Michael that we don't know about, because uh, Harold's kind of, like, going through everyone's gifts and blah blah Michael, I think Michael started drinking when Alan attacked Emery. Is that when he started drinking? Uh, yes. That makes sense. So Michael's but getting a little... At this point little... in the movie, Alan, or Michael is fully drinking. Yeah, like, he's getting a little mean at this point. Not full mean yet, but a little mean at this point. And he's sort of, like, quipping back and forth with Harold, and... Uh, Harold opens Michael's present, and it's a framed photo of Michael with a personal inscription. And we don't know what the inscription was, but again, that changes the vibe, where suddenly, like, Harold's not as quippy with Michael anymore. Yeah. It's very interesting. Whatever was on the inscription, which we never find out, but whatever it is, uh, it clearly, like, meant a lot to Harold, and he didn't expect yeah. this. Yeah. So, he was very caught off guard, and he was very thankful. And then he quickly hid it so no one else would see it. hmm So, he, like, there, there was something there which adds to the, there's a thing between Harold and Michael. Yeah. So, yeah, it adds that there's definitely some tension there. And then... They're eating cake and having dinner. Mm-hmm. Uh, did anything happen with the cake and dinner? Um, not that I can remember. I feel like that was kind of like a lull in all the drama. It's a calming moment, yeah. Yeah. And then... Uh, it starts to rain. What? It starts to rain, but also something sets Michael off. Oh, it's Alan. Alan comes down. Uh, so it starts to rain, so everyone runs inside. Alan comes down from the bathroom. He's done throwing up, and he's going to leave, which is a reasonable reaction. And Michael won't let him leave, which is interesting. Michael's getting mean now, and also Michael, it's obvious Michael now has, like, a bone to pick. <laughs> like, I think Michael he... never heard Alan, or never saw, I don't think Michael ever saw Alan be so blatantly homophobic before yeah like it was always but, kind of a passing thing before but this way he like made it very physical and direct mm-hmm. and he was like he was done yeah and kind of what we thought what we talked about before with like uh michael michael's other friend from college like him and alan were like in love with each other and blah blah so uh, Michael's like, I'm going to get you to admit this, basically, to Alan. In his own head. He didn't say that out loud. Um, anyway, so he won't let Michael, I mean, Alan leave. And he's, uh, like, we're gonna play a game, and then you can leave. And he thinks of the most dangerous game I've ever heard of in my whole life, and also just, like, fucking emotionally painful and I don't know why anyone agreed to play because I would have been like fuck you (laughs) you're an asshole um so and I think this is a good time to talk about Emery and Bernard because they are sort of like the first victims of this game uh Michael proposes that they play a game where you have to call the person you've like loved like truly loved and uh, there's like a point system so like if you call you get a point and then like if they pick up you get another point and then like if you tell them you love them you get another po- like five points or something but first of all emotionally dangerous but also actually just like dangerous dangerous because at this point you can can't you go to jail for being gay at this point uh i don't know i think so like yeah they talk they, about police raids a lot yeah they talk about emery getting like uh arrested at like a bathhouse yes so i'm pretty sure you can dangerous on so many levels this game um and we start with emery and bernard who are kind of like i at least i sort of saw them as like a package deal for most of the thing not as they weren't dating or anything they just seemed like really close friends um they do seem like close friends yeah 
Yeah, like, they they showed up together. Did they? Maybe I'm making that up. They seem like close friends. They're hanging out together most of the time. Um, And poor Bernard, at this point, is when the start of Michael's, like, racist outbursts, which were very shocking to me. I wasn't expecting that. Um... And I, I wasn't a fan. Well, I, I, kinda... I don't think this makes them better. I think that was him just trying to be mean for the sake of mean. Yeah, but like, it I was, like, fucked up. I don't think he was trying up. to do it, like, to be racist. I think he was trying to do it to be, like, to intentionally hurt Bernard by being racist. Which doesn't make him better. kind of makes them worse. It does, yeah. But he... I just, I like, every time I heard it, I'm like, Michael, go to bed. Yeah, it was so, it was so fucked up. Like, and it was, like, Bernard, to my memory, didn't do anything to him for the whole movie. Like, it wasn't like Bernard was being mean or an asshole to Michael. Michael was just like, haha, I'll be racist and hurt your feelings. And it was like, Michael, that's fucking way over the line. Like, Jesus. Uh, anyway, Bernard calls this guy who he used to work for his mom worked for his parents and so he used to work for them too in the summers and he said that he's been like in love with him his whole life and there was a there was actually a really pretty scene of them like uh swimming naked in like a pool together yes. and it was kind of like their their major interaction i don't really know what happened if they just swam or if they kissed it like wasn't super explicitly stated exactly what happened i think they like, they had a romantic night. I don't know yeah. if they said specifically, you're right. But um, they... It was definitely romantic, whatever happened. Yes. But uh, I remember uh, this pool scene. They show them, like, skinny dipping in shadows. But you it's can very see prettily shot. front male genitalia, which I was, like, mm -hmm. proud of the movie, because most movies are too afraid to do that in this type of situation. Yeah. I was but just... yeah, it was... That pool scene was very pretty. It's actually, it's interesting. Every flashback we see, what? every flashback we see is normally shot in a, in a far more stylized manner than the um, rest of the film, which makes sense because it's, uh, it's kind of like seeing it through a memory. Yeah. Okay. So Bernard calls in like a moment of being egged on and he's like drunk and being stupid he, like, calls and he ends up talking to the guy's mom and the guy is, like, away on a date. And he, it, it kind of, we aren't sure if he's going to say anything or not. Like, if he's, because part of the game is, like, if you say you love them, you get five points, whatever. He It, it kind of goes back and forth on if he's going to say it, but he, he doesn't. And then he's very upset afterwards. And a really... <sighs> cruel part of this game is like you are calling someone who you've loved for years and you're gay and it's illegal to be gay so you don't even in most cases you don't even know like it's it's a very high probability that the person you're in love with is homophobic <laughs> uh so you're doing this insane insanely intense thing and michael's in the fucking background being like one point at two points and you're like crying on the phone and i'm like michael fuck off fuck off michael this is not the time like it was so oh, it was so grating to just hear him counting out the points and it happens every phone call like he's just yes. he is so strict about this game yeah oh cruel it's cruel. It's just wild. and i felt so bad for bernard after because he regret he was so upset that he did it yeah. Which, like, he didn't even really say, he didn't even say anything bad. So, like, he's okay. Emery. He just called. Emery. Yeah. Uh, Emery was, like, in love he with the guy. He literally just said, like, my condol, or, although it was weird that he called, like, I think the problem was he called, like, at one in the morning. <laughs> yeah. That's also part of the, the weirdness, is that they're calling very late at night. Then uh, Emery but... calls. Yeah, his backstory was very sad. Like, he had this this crush on this guy who was older than him. And um, when he was, I think, like, a senior in high school or something, um, this guy had, 
become a dentist and and he 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 went to to him it was very oh it was very like bittersweet he like went to him to get his teeth clean but it was because he had like a really big crush on him and he said he wanted to like be his friend and uh the guy was like really nice and said yes and then emery bought him like a present um again because he's fucking in love with him and then like everyone found out somehow um da- so everyone I think was like the daughter or the sister told the school oh so everyone found out and everyone was like making fun of him yeah i felt so bad he was just so sad yeah. And you never seem sad the, like the rest of the movie before this. There's just so much energy. Yeah. And he was just defeated. And he's like, no, yeah. I'll hug so you. He calls and he he does get him, but the, the guy doesn't know who he is. And he's like, oh, I think you have the wrong number. And he hangs up on him, which wasn't even him being cruel because Emery was being very weird. Like, he was like. Oh, I'm I'm just a friend. Like I would have thought it was like someone prank calling me or something, you know. Yes, but I it was still devastating. Yeah. And then basically the two of them are sad for the rest of the night. Yeah, and then they go get like pie together when they leave, yeah. which I'm I'm glad they did. There there also was like a weird thing where Michael was talking. Michael was trying to stir stir shit up, and he was being talking to Menard and he was like why do you let Emery speak to you like that and I didn't even remember Emery speaking to Menard in any way do you know what Michael was talking about I don't I didn't personally remember it but I think the idea was that Emery would use bad words about Michael or about Bernard's Bernard. race uh really I think the idea was, like, he would say them, but, like, in a joking way. Yeah. Maybe I missed that. But I did, I liked that interaction because Bernard was, like, uh, you know, Emery can, like, I let Emery say that about me because, like, <laughs> it was kind of intense because he was, like, Emery needs to feel better than me <laughs> or something. Uh, but I liked that after that interaction, Emery was, like, I'll never speak to you like that again. Like, he didn't realize it was something that was, like, hurting Bernard in any way. So I did appreciate that Emery, like, apologized. And he was like, I will stop doing that. Yes, it was very good. He was immediately like, mm, okay, won't do it again. So sorry. Yeah. Do you know what Emery uh, did for a job? No. No idea. Because right. he just seemed like he was very rich. That's true. But I couldn't figure out, like, what he did. So yeah. I was trying I to figure really it out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, up next is, is Hank and Larry, and we kind of touched on that, because Hank calls their own answering machine to tell Larry he loves him, and then that, it kind of leads to them working out their shit a little bit. Uh, and it was cute, because I, Larry genuinely was shocked when he did that. He was shocked, which was surprising, because Hank left his wife for him. But I, th- but it was, uh, yeah. I Hank was it, it was such a it was such a sweet gesture for Hank to call their answering machine. But I it wasn't that was really an answering cute. machine. Like it was a person. It was. Yeah. Oh, like, I didn't know that. It was like a doorman or something. It wasn't just a person. It wasn't like just a recording machine like that. Oh. Which is why they were kind of shocked because they just told he told someone he was gay. Yeah. And I like that Alan, Alan was, like, betrayed. <laughs> Alan was, like, betrayed that Hank was acting so gay. <laughs> he was so was kind of... He's like, no, you're the straight one, Alan. Yeah, was he was like, like no. he was like, Hank, why would you do that? <laughs> Dude, you were going to go and watch I, the football game. Uh, I really like Hank. I think I'm a Hank stan. Because Hank was like, why not? It's true. Like, he was so, even though... Like, he knew that he was, like, the straight one for Alan, but he was also so unapologetic in, like, breaking that for him. He was like, I am in love with him. Yeah. And I, then they had their whole conversation, Hank and Larry. Yeah. And then I liked how at the end of their conversation, uh, they talked, and then I think it was Bernard or Emery, someone says, okay, they get ten points, because... They said it. 
And then yeah. Michael's like, they didn't say it on the phone. It doesn't count. So Larry mm-hmm. just goes to the kitchen, calls the second line in the living room. Yeah. And is like, <sighs> and he just yells out in such a funny way. This is my favorite moment in the whole film for some reason. He just yells out, Hank, it's for you! Yeah, because, like, everyone is just standing there, like, not picking up. Which is <laughs> weird, because like, it was fairly obvious what he was doing. And then he does all the stuff to get the ten points. Which is, like, that was cute. Yeah. And then Hank and Larry go, like, to have sex in Michael's room. So they're sort of, like, uh, gone from the party situation now. Yeah. That's the end of their storyline. So then what happens? Does anyone go after them? I don't think they do. They Oh, Alan, no, wait. I think Michael and uh, Harold have another altercation Uh, where someone's like, Michael, are you going to go? And Harold's like, he's never left anyone. And then he goes on this weird thing where he's like, yeah, I know what game. You got to be careful with me, Michael, because I know what game you're playing. And and. I'm as good at it as you no, are. This is their their reverse order. What that comes after Michael confronts Alan. Ah, uh, okay. According to the Wikipedia article, uh, so Alan Michael confronts Alan like super angry, and he's like, yeah. "I know you were a secret gay in college very, with this boy named Justin." I almost felt like Michael was Justin. Like it was very, he was very invested in in Justin. Well, I always got the vibe that Michael liked Alan. Me too. I did too, yeah. But he he didn't want to do anything because he wasn't gay. But he also kind of knew he was gay. So when yeah. he was being super homophobic, he wanted to be like, dude, I know you were gay. Yeah. Uh, so. Justin and Alan were basically like, they were both friends with Michael. And they were like the bestest of friends. And apparently Alan would not shut up about Justin. Um, but Michael knows from Justin. Or Michael who was is told now, by Justin. He doesn't actually yeah. know for sure. Well, Justin is now like um an out like gay person. Um that like him and Alan were sleeping together. And apparently, according to Justin, the reason that they sort of stopped communicating was because Justin came like was ready to be like out and gay and like Alan couldn't deal with that. Um, so they stopped talking. But all of this is done with the clouds that uh, Alan's like very much denying it. Yeah. And so we don't know for sure if Justin just lied to Alan or, mis- to or misrepresented the situation or if Alan's just lying right now. I think Alan is lying. I mean, I got the vibe the whole time that he was closeted. I... I got the vibe he was closeted, but I don't know if he had a full relationship. Yeah. It's weird, too, because we get, we, we, we suddenly get very invested in Justin, but we've, we've never met him. He's just been mentioned, like, once up until this point. Yes. Um, so that's interesting, too, because it's like, we don't have a, a vibe for this person. Like, we don't have any way to be like, oh, I don't think Justin would lie, or I do think he would lie, you know? And all this is overlooming with us that we still don't know why uh, we still don't know why Alan called Michael originally very upset, crying. Yeah. So we're like, maybe this was it. And then we're like, yeah. we're not sure. Anyway, Michael forces Alan to call, and he thinks mm-hmm. he's calling Justin. Mm-hmm. And Alan picks up the phone and says, hi, it's me, Alan. I love you. And Michael mm-hmm. picks the phone right from his hand and screams, ha, I told you, Justin. Yeah. But it turns out it was Alan's wife. Yep. Michael's like shook to his core. Yeah. And then Alan like leaves after that. Um... And the only other time we see him is he's, like, drinking in a bar. So we don't really know what what happened with him. If he was lying, if he actually goes back to his wife. Because it's implied he maybe left her to come to New York. Or who knows. Um, so we have no idea what happens with Alan after this point. And then 
Um, I think uh, Harold and Michael have their little altercation, like I talked about, which again feels like they're talking about something that we don't know about. <laughs> they have a big fight, and basically Harold informs Michael that he's always going to be gay, just like the rest of them, and he has to deal with it. Yeah. Which was a little weird, because I was like, I don't think Michael was ever not pretending to be gay. But then yeah. again, I guess he kind of was with the friend. So maybe that's why he was holding on to Alan as a friend, because he was like, uh, this is my connection to being straight. Yeah. It's just I don't know. I think I think Harold I think it's heavily implied that the reason Michael gets so mean has when he's drunk has to do with like the shame he feels. So I feel like that's what Harold was talking about, but I don't know for sure. Because Harold is so unclear and he just talks in like poems. <laughs> yeah. And after this he Harold leaves. And he takes the cowboy and his presents with him. Yeah. So then we just have Michael and Donald left. Because uh, 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 Larry Emery and Hank are and, technically uh, still there. Because Emery and Ber- Bernard have also left. Yeah, they go to the diner. And um, I actually, I really like this scene. I think it was one of the my favorites. I actually wrote down a line from it because... Michael kind of starts to have a panic attack and Donald is, uh, you know, trying to calm him down. And what did Michael say? If, if we could only learn to not hate ourselves so very much. Very, it was a very emotional line and I found that line very moving. I liked that line a lot. Well, I liked how once everyone left, like Michael starts like breaking down. Yeah. Uh, Donald's kind of, like, okay, stop it at first, because mm-hmm. he's like, Michael, you were kind of a jerk everyone tonight. I don't care that you're sad. But then Michael, like, goes from being sad to, as you said, like, full-blown panic attack. And Donald's mm-hmm. like, okay, he needs help. And he helps him. That was a moving speech with them crying at the floor. Yeah. But then Michael also is kind of an asshole again, I think, because he talks about I don't, Donald had been in town for um, the party, but he was also like seeing someone like it was implied he like maybe has like a boyfriend or something who canceled on him that he was like sad about. And then like Michael says something shitty about that. And then Donald gets like pissed at him again. Yes. Yeah. So, Michael, it's also, oh, uh, we missed this, but part of also a thingy I liked at the sort of end of the party after everything has happened is, like, even when Harold leaves, he's like, see you next week. And it's, I like the implication that this was uh, k- kind of normal, <laughs> like, like this level of, of intense intensity wasn't actually that out of the norm. So it was like, even though everyone had been sort of like at each other's throats and like piss at each other for multiple reasons it was it was still like okay see you tomorrow you know yes i thought that was interesting i like that mm-hmm. i liked it because it added that sense of a uh, okay this is just how they are it made me feel and... less bad because yeah. they were like the, them having strong nights of strong tension isn't unnormal for them yeah um, and, and, uh, also what was interesting was Michael asked Donald after everyone's leave, he's like, how late is it? And Donald was like, it's, it's still really early. Uh, which I also thought was interesting because we don't really have an idea of how much time has passed, but the concept of it still being really early, which we kind of is corroborated with everyone, like Emery and Bernard go out to a diner, Alan goes to a bar, like it still seems relatively early in the night. Yes. I thought that was really interesting because it felt like so much had happened, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so Michael kind of, like, leaves. He he feels, he's like, I can't stay here. And he goes to, like, a um, like a, a midnight mass sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, and then everyone else you see going home. Uh, and then you see Michael again. Uh, he exits the mass and he just 
turns and he runs down the street. Yeah. And that's the end. I don't know what running down the street meant. I don't know. I think he was just fucking stressed out. Uh, yeah, that's probably it. I couldn't, like, I'm sure some deep philosophical thinker will talk, would say it means, like, the passage of movement in time or something. But I was just, I would just say, yeah, he just looked like he had a hard night and he had to stress run. Yeah, exactly. And it was, like, a good visual to end on. But, yeah, it was, this film is basically, like, gay trauma. (laughs) And just, like, yes, a party in which everyone's gay trauma comes out and then tries to bite each other, you know? Yeah. They're all, like, very traumatized people. Which is a lot to handle. And I kind of... Again, I I didn't know that that was what I was signing up for, so it was a shocking amount of, like, emotion for me. Um, Yeah. I didn't didn't know it would be quite as intense as I thought. I knew it was a drama. I had no idea. I thought it was going to be, like, Bohemian Rhapsody or something. (laughs) No, it was not Bohemian Rhapsody. (laughs) Uh, So, yeah. I guess, do you have any final thoughts on it? Yeah, I don't know. I'm very, like, undecided on the movie. Because I... I don't think I'll ever watch it again. No. But that could be, like, my my own personal thing. Because I don't think it's badly done. But again, because I was expecting something so different, I think it's hard for me to have... <laughs> It's hard for me to get over the shock of that and have, like, a opinion of the movie just how it is, you know? But I do think it does what it's setting out to do uh, very well. Just what it's setting out to do isn't normally what I'm after when I'm watching films. But that doesn't mean that the f- the film is, like, inherently bad. Uh, yes, I can understand that. Uh, it's a very intense film in that very moment. Very intense. But, yeah. Or throughout that. But I was glad it was... I'm glad to saw it. It was good. Thank you for watching this week's episode at Friends at Film Camp. We'll see you next time at the campfire. <laughs>